Well, hey there, and welcome back to Heimler's History. Now we've been going through Unit 6 of the AP US History Curriculum, and in this video, we're gonna be talking about labor in the Gilded Age. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. Now, in the last video, I gave my estimation of the Gilded Age, which was that it was like a golden covered turd. And depending on what we're talking about, sometimes there's more gold than turd, and other times there's more turd than gold. When it comes to labor in the Gilded Age, the gold is so thin that it's hard not to see the turd underneath. But if you wanted in duller, more academic language, then basically in this video we're going to try to explain the socioeconomic continuities and changes associated with the growth of industrial capitalism from 1865 to 1898. So with the industrialization of America, a great dividing line was drawn between the rich and the poor, and let's talk about them bougie folks first. This class of wealthy business owners largely surpassed the previous generation in terms of wealth, and one of the things they liked to do with that wealth was to put it on display for everyone to see. It Economist Thornstein Veblen coined a phrase for this kind of exhibitionism, calling it conspicuous consumption. Case in point, in 1895, construction was completed on what is the largest private residence in the nation, the Biltmore House. This incredible structure boasts over 175,000 square feet of floor space, 35 bedrooms, 45 bathrooms, which, you know, is a little over the top. I mean, everyone knows that you don't need any more than 42 bathrooms in your house. Anyway, to further illustrate this conspicuous consumption, here's where I tell you that the Biltmore House was was Vanderbilt's vacation home. This is his main residence in Manhattan. So what I'm laboring to show you is that not everyone in this wealthy class was as opulent and gaudy as Vanderbilt, but they all engaged in these kind of practices. Now, over on the other side of the tracks, many people lived in poverty. Their wages were well below what would be considered a comfortable standard of living, and the working class suffered in the waves of economic turmoil. For example, as a result of the Panic of 1873 and the Panic of 1893, the wealthy classes were pretty well insulated but the working class found their wages dropping precipitously. However, it will be important for you to know that though everything I just said was in fact true, it's not the whole story. Because of the rise of mass production of goods, prices on many common items decreased. And at the same time, even though the wages of the working class were in general meager, they rose across the board. And that meant that more goods and services were available to industrial workers than ever before, whether they were immigrants from Europe or migrants from the rural West. So the point is, even though the gap between the rich and the poor grew during this period, many Americans saw their standards of living rising. Okay, now, despite the fact that the standards of living were, in fact, rising, that doesn't mean that the working class did not expend themselves to increase their own wages and force better safety standards in their workplace. After all, factory work, not to mention railroad and mining work, was a dangerous business for the workers. Like, during this period, the working class racked up thousands of personal injuries and premature deaths owing to the nature of their work. However, workers found it difficult to address this problem within the structure of the large corporations. Like, if any one worker walked up to a factory manager and demanded higher wages and better safety standards, the manager could just fire that worker and find a giant pool of recently arrived immigrants who would be happy to work for those wages and under those conditions. So the solution to this for workers was the formation of labor unions. Where one worker's voice was irrelevant when they joined together into a large union, all of the sudden factory owners had to listen. And unions employed different tactics to fight for fair treatment of workers, including political action and slowdowns and strikes. As an example of the latter, let's consider the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. In that year, railroad companies cut wages to save money during a recession, and so unionized railroad workers went on strike to protest. The strike spread to 11 states and shut down more than 60% of the nation's railroads, and eventually the strike grew so tense that violence broke out, and in response, President Hayes sent in federal troops to restore order. But once once the dust settled, over a hundred people were dead. And so railroad employers were able to behold the power of unionized resistance and therefore came to the negotiating table to hear the grievances of the laboring class and to work to improve their wages and working conditions. Another significant strike was the Pullman strike near Chicago. The Pullman company manufactured sleeping cars for trains and when the Panic of 1893 hit, George Pullman decided that the best way to save money was to cut the wages of his workers. When the union workers came to bargain with him, he just went ahead and fired all 
all of them. And so the rest of the workers went on strike, and another union leader, Eugene V. Debs, directed the members of his union not to work on any trains that had Pullman cars in them. Now, of course, owners of railroads and owners of train cars are very closely tied together, and the railroad owners, not surprisingly, were on Pullman's side in this fight. And so they all cooked up a scheme to fix the problem, and what they did was to hook up Pullman cars to trains carrying federal mail, and that meant if the workers interfered with the trains, then they had Big Daddy government to answer to. And so Eugene Debs and other leaders were eventually jailed for hindering rail traffic of federally authorized trains, and the strike was essentially broken after that. Now, at this point, it'll be helpful for you to know the names and goals of some of the biggest and most influential labor unions. First, let me introduce you to the Knights of Labor, which went public in 1881. The Knights of Labor was a truly national union which opened up its membership to anyone who wanted to join. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, here's the part where Heimler says, yeah, anyone could join just as long as you were a man and white. But hey, boo. Don't be so cynical. The Knights of Labor actually did open up their ranks to black laborers and women as well. Now, the main goals of this union was the destruction of trusts and monopolies as well as the abolition of child labor. Child labor? Oh, yeah. Kids as young as 10, and in some cases even younger, were members of the industrial workforce. In fact, by the end of the 19th century, children between the ages of 10 and 15 constituted something like 18% of the workforce. And the reason this was odious to the Knights of Labor was because the children were every bit as subject to injury and death, as were the adult workers. And so with children maimed and dead because of industrial work, the Knights of Labor worked to abolish such practices. Now, at its peak, the Knights of Labor had over 700,000 members on its rolls, and thus became a very powerful voice for laborers. However, the organization basically fell apart after a single event, namely the Haymarket Square Riot in 1886. And the story goes like this. In May of that year, many members of the Knights of Labor gathered in the Haymarket Square in Chicago to celebrate the May Day labor movement. They protested peacefully for an eight-hour workday. However, at one point, a bomb exploded, and later it was discovered that the bomber was probably an anarchist completely unaffiliated with the Knights. But unfortunately for them, the American public largely associated this bombing with the Knights of Labor themselves, and the sentiment regarding labor unions shifted. All of a the sudden, they were seen as violent and radical, and all of a the sudden, their membership began declining rapidly. Another labor union you do well to know is the American Federation of Labor, which was an association of craft workers led by the indomitable Samuel Gompers. By 1981, the AFL boasted a million members, and their goals were much the same as the Knights of Labor, higher wages, safer working conditions. And even though they began their work in this period, much of the fruit of their labor won't occur until the next period, so we're gonna revisit the AFL later. All right, thanks for watching. If you need more videos on Unit 6, then right here's the playlist. If you need help getting an A in your class and a five on your exam in May, then click right here and grab my review packet, which will make all your dreams come true. And if you want me to keep making these videos, then subscribe, and I shall oblige Heimler out.